uh, uh, repatriation recovery action between North Korea and the United States, uh, but it was stopped in 2005. So, uh, so I think it's good that we're starting. And also having simply having a project that United States and North Korea can do together, right? Over this very, you know, this is the, you know, the, the issue will create, I think, a sort of spirit, new spirit or atmosphere of cooperation, right? So you can imagine how uh, those American, you know, uh, the, the soldiers or the, the, the NGOs or government can go to North Korea and then work together. So there, and the one, one, the second important thing is about yes, North Korea have just repatriated about fifty-five. You know, it's just the beginning. Right? It's just the beginning. This time, North Korea did not have any precondition. Did not ask for money. North Korea spent all its own financial resources to, you know, process. So it has to give again the credit to North Korea. But instead, what you're hearing from American media is all about, you know, no matter what North Korea does or even Trump does in this case, it is about the immediate criticism. Um, and the third thing, I, again, I want to point out is that we are sort of in right now at a stalemate, right, in the, at the Singapore summit. And uh, um, a lot of Korean analysts are arguing that this could be. Uh, this this is time now. United States must have done something, you know, reciprocal, you know, action. So that's I think why the significance of this latest repatriation of uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers missing in action. But this wasn't a reciprocal action on the part of the U.S. This was a exactly. uh, another one on the part of North Korea. So yeah. what do we see other than the U.S. Uh, halting the military exercises? Is there anything else that the U.S. is doing, either positive or negative? United States, you know, I actually have a kept a score where I share with the, some of our, um, um, you know, people in my group, and uh, I kept a score where United States has done only two. That is, the, as you mentioned, canceling one uh, U.S. South Korea working, and North Korea has done about so far as of up to date. I was giving by thirteen. Uh, initiative, right? It was a sort of unilateral, uh, 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 proactive action, um, and uh, so respond in response to your question, I would say United States has not really done much. Uh, United States has uh, has done, uh, you know, again still insisting on one way or the other, insisting on the complete denuclearization of North Korea, and the one sticking point that we all now, I hope that everybody have, have a clear understanding is that North Korea would like to have a strongest possible uh, security guarantee from the United States. So that would mean uh, ending the current state of war. That's what North Korea wants. Um, and uh, I, I remember last time when Pompeo went to uh, Pyongyang and uh, there was one North Korea was demanding this security guarantee but which you know, uh, Pompeo was not uh, willing to uh, give before the complete denuclearization of North Korea. So that is meant. And, uh, but if you're going back to still about the you know, United States has done only two actions where North Korea has again and again, again, this long list of uh, proactive action, uh, what it means is that it's time. So what is the, the main, issue here, our priority. The main issue is to end the, you know, the current state of war, start the process of uh, uh, signing a peace treaty, right? So that I hope that we could uh, have some, um, you know, uh, have some uh, priority. So I just want to uh, let the listeners know who might have turned in late that we're speaking to Simone Chun, who is a professor, an analyst, a writer, and a uh, an activist around uh, peace in the Korean Peninsula. I'm Medea Benjamin with Code Pink. And we're talking now about what are some of the actions that the US and North Korea have taken. And Simone, you mentioned, you said there were two. So one was that the US has halted the military exercises mm -hmm. with South mm -hmm. Korea. What's the other one that you are referring so the other, to? The other one will be the, the Singapore summit. Right. Oh, so and the, the, the summit, itself summit, summit itself. So one meeting and one, the suspension of a one uh, war game and one meeting. That's it. Uh, so yeah, on the negative uh, side, um, it seems that you have put out something that hasn't been covered in the uh -huh. U.S. press about U.S. military exercises with uh -huh. Japan that are uh -huh. threatening to North Korea. Can you explain what that is about? Um, July 27, that is on the anniversary of a signing of an armistice to halt you know, halted Korean War, 
uh, there was a report. At this time, actually, Japan uh, released uh, the information. A uh, U.S. Uh, Japan joint um, uh, military exercises, which involves, uh, you know, B-52, which actually, you know, this can be loaded with have a nuclear capability. But and the report says that there was no nuclear weapon was not uh, loaded. Um, so the it, the the reason they provide was to uh, contain or to prepare for any North Korea provocation. Now, uh, the timing is very significant. We're talking about a. We are still in this process of a rapprochement. Uh, the, you know, the, we're trying to have the diplomatic solution, seeking diplomatic solution with the North Korea, and also after Singapore summit, but on the, and especially on the day that marks the uh, armistice, the fact that United States and Japan, um, you know, uh, executed that joint military exercise, it really, sh I would say this is, this is, a, it is a clear violation of the Singapore, the spirit of Singapore summit, right? Um, and and also, as you call the um, and, 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 and at, at the same time, also, while North Korea has again with providing all this initiative, you know, to to for normalization with the United States, that United States is not coming forthcoming and is kind of in, in, you know responding to North Korea is really I would say that really the creating a big obstacles. And uh, as I the court here, very, you know, a uh, Korean professor, expert on, on the U.S. North Korean Korean relationship, Professor David C. Gang at USC, he said that North Korea is unlikely to move much farther without the U.S. making a move first. So it's now right now it's time for United States to take a concrete action, which I think will should be, ought to be. Um, starting process to end this current state of war. And actually, we can talk more about it later, though, you know, right now, Pompeo will attending um, ASEAN uh, uh, foreign ministers meeting this Saturday. And uh, there we can, there will be for the first time since the Singapore summit, right? We will, there are three uh, foreign ministers, right? United States, North Korea, South Korea will be in one place. So uh, I think we should be this week, we should really, really, you know, uh, uh, um, raise an issue for the to start the process ending this uh, Korean War. So um, when uh, maybe this list that you have that shows mm -hmm. all of these initiatives on the North Korean side and only two on the US is something we can put up on the Facebook afterwards. Mm -hmm. for people who want Absolutely. To yeah. I think that is certainly not what you uh, read about in the U.S. press. Yeah, so but, let me just go quickly yeah. go through like I would, the list that I have, uh, North Korea, A, contribute to successful Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Second, successfully held the first inter-Korean summit with the President Moon Jae-in, uh, which is the historic Panmunjom Declaration. Third, released American prisoners. Fourth, implemented nuclear, again, unilateral nuclear test moratorium. Fifth, implemented, again, unilaterally missile test moratorium closed the uh, 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 Pyongyang nuclear test site, dismantled key satellite launching site at Soha, Sohe, uh, recommended or recommenced the return of American troops killed during the Korean War, celebrate the 65th victory day, which was uh, uh, July 27th. Uh, this time there's no anti-American propaganda banners, right? And, uh, and finally, North Korea said, in their uh, North Korean Central News Agency, they said that they really recommend, they really want a declaration, swift declaration on the termination of war as the first and foremost process, the first step. Right? So we have this, so North Korea, in other words, they, pro they offer very concrete, constructive, achievable goal. I think which we should uh, uh, um, you know, pay attention to. Wonderful, I think that would be a great thing to post for people to have. And now I want to move into another issue, which is, you know, as you well know, I've written and talked about this whole initiative is thanks to the uh, people uprising in South Korea, the mm -hmm. election of a president who mm -hmm. uh, was elected with the mandate to begin this process, President Moon. So could you talk about what is happening in terms of North and South relations? Have there been these same ups and downs, fits and starts, or has it been a kind of steady process? Yeah, North and South religion, you know, it has been, I, it has been very steady. 
uh, just two days ago, there was a higher level, second high level military talks between North and South Korea. Uh, again, if you look at the Western media, American media, they say, oh, you know, they could not agree and uh, there was no agreement. So that was bad. But if you look at the detail, uh, North Korea, both sides that they thought it was a productive, it was a typical so negotiation process where you, you know, you, uh, you take a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, what they agree was that truly make the demilitar demilitarized zone, a DMZ, as a truly like, you know, demilitarized, right? So it's what I'm saying is that a lot of, this is actually the most heavily militarized, you and I've been there, heavily militarized a place. Uh, I think when we went to the women across the NZ and the last peace delegation is a Korean, our, our sisters, Korean sisters, so peace activists, I thought, you know, one uh, dream that we had was, you know, let's make, create a sort of a, 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 a physical place like a park or a center or a house where we thought, right, uh, where we, women can just, it's like permanently stationed there, right, create. <laughs> So there was actually one initiative we came out. So I think that could be actually in the creating of the turning, transforming DMZ as sort of a real true uh, peace park. And in fact, creating, transforming DMZ as a sort of a, like for, the, for the entire world, the symbol of a peace, right? Uh, so I'm not saying that the, the, the two Korea agreed on that, but I think there was talk about how transform demilitarized on truly de demilitarized uh, place, um, and that there's uh, uh, not, you know South North and South Korea now we are there they they are going uh, implementing the inter Korean uh, railroad uh, connection reconnecting the you know railroad that was disconnected, and there's all kinds of uh, uh, plan for. Um, the uh, cultural arts uh, uh, um, cooperation. And August 11th, there's going to be the actually the largest or the first, the largest actually Korea, North Koreans are going to, you know, come to the number of Korean, come to Seoul for the workers, uh, what called North and South Korean workers soccer match, right? Mm -hmm. so that's going to be really fun. Uh, that was also stopped uh, for uh, during this Park uh, Geun-hye, you know, uh, conservative administration. Uh, so this is the idea: is that you know workers should lead the peace movement, right? So unification, workers led unification. Uh, so there is all kinds of uh, uh, you know exciting uh, news. But of course, the biggest news, you know, which we is upcoming is uh, August twenty between August twentieth and twenty sixth. There's going to be a, the reunion of a, a separated families. Right? Oh, uh, so that's starting in at the end of August. August yeah, at the end of August. So it's it's a really I mean, it's it's a it's a pact. And also, one more thing: August fifteenth, uh, August fifteenth is the uh, Korea's for Korea is the liberation day, liberated from thirty six years of brutal Japanese colonization at the end of World War Two, uh, surrendering Japan surrendering. Uh, to, uh, uh, and so Koreans are going to mark this as a sort of uh, um, North and South Korea share one interest that is we, you know, we were one nation, so we want to celebrate the liberation. Um, mm. So there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, um, um, initiative. And uh, but one thing I would like to point out is that very important. North and South Korea want, I think pretty much majority of Koreans, I, I you know, North, 80 million Korean support the current peace process. I'm confident. And most people in Asia, Northeast Asia appreciate the current process. Probably the entire world appreciate the process. What is something, one thing that is stopping, that is concretely, no matter how much North and South Korea wants you know, implement, expedite, accelerate this process, there is one thing that is like, that is the sanctions, right? UN, US led and also South Korea is actually constrained to participating. So let's suppose even the family union to implement those family reunion and gathering, you know, you need the, it's a logistic issue, right? And uh, North Korea is a heavily thing. It's just a very, literally, as a, if, you, if you read the report about the, came out from uh, American Fan Service by, uh, you know, Dan Jasper, who did a great job about, you know, producing that, creating that report. It's, it's North Korea is currently like almost like economic embargo, it's harshest economic embargo. So, um, so there is all this, this is really, it's really uh, affect the, the current inter Korean, uh, you know, any the sort of a repression on and uh, um, exchanges. So that's one thing that we can, I think we really have to um, really address. 
Yeah, I mean, let's wait. I'll talk about the sanctions in a minute, but I just want to uh, let listeners know who don't um, recall this that mm -hmm. that uh, the Trump administration has put a travel ban on U.S. citizens uh -huh. going to North Korea, and while there are supposed to be exceptions for humanitarian uh, workers and a couple of other exemptions, mm -hmm. uh, as we saw in the American Friends Service Committee report, uh, it has made any kind of uh, humanitarian programs a lot more complicated. It takes a long time to get these exemptions. It's hard to get exemptions for some of the goods that are uh, deemed to be, quote, dual use. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, um, it's just made the agricultural exchange programs much more difficult, um, the sending in of, of medical equipment. Uh, so um, yes, that is something very concrete that we can push the Trump administration uh, because those sanctions, uh, the travel ban uh, does end at the end of August, right? And it would have to be renewed by the administration. So that's something concrete we could work towards. Uh, but much more important for the people of North Korea are the sanctions in general. And there have been some new reports by the UN that show the uh, horrible situation in particularly in the countryside for children mm -hmm. and how these sanctions are really mm -hmm. um, uh, creating a situation of uh, lack of food and medicines. And uh, on that level, it seems that these very draconian sanctions uh, are not being adhered to totally by the Chinese. And I wonder uh, how it seems there have been some reports that talk about trade already being uh, initiated or, or, or brought back with China. Um, how does that happen when China has agreed through the UN to the sanctions? The China, actually, you're right. There are some reports. Uh, many reports indicate that the China has uh, uh, now renewed right? uh, some of the economic activities present on the border right? with the North Korea. And in fact, China just released a couple of weeks ago the major, major billions of dollars investment in the building those infrastructure. Um, but as you know, the actually the, the what China is doing, and also Russia is, as we will also see that was somewhat of a, a lessening of, of um, those sanctions from the Russia side. And China, as you recall, again, going back to if you look, with the United States position, it is not really the, to, to really insisting on this maxim, maximum sanctions regime pressure does not really benefit uh, uh, anybody does not benefit even the interests, you know, does not even help the interests of the United States. What happened is that, you know, the more harsh sanction that you actually impose, North Korea, you know, is, North Korea has proven to, to, to survive, right? North Korea, there's this idea, North Korea, the people the North, North Korea is going to collapse and any, you know, anytime soon, but that happened to be wrong. And North Korea has seen people have been terribly, I mean, I'm sure they're very suffering, but it's very resilient. And there's a lot of also, so what they developed was there's informal economies, right? North Korea, they developed income just to, to survive. And uh, uh, yes, China is uh, renewing its uh, uh, economic activities with North Korea. And uh, I think for the United States, what will happen is, uh, you know, it's just really the sanctions regime will, uh, continuing the sanctions will make uh, North Korea more dependent on um, China, right? And uh, some in South Korea think that this is all does not benefit North Korea. I mean, people in South Korea think that they want to, you know, help North Korea economically. And they actually want North Korea to depend on South Korea, right? So even if North Korea have, uh, let's say, it has still maintained its nuclear weapon, if you're economically so interconnected, you're not going to be likely to, you know, uh, use. And uh, so that's, that's less insensitive. Um, and also the uh, North Korea, if you look at it uh, right now um, uh, from the Korean side, because the United States still have not done really, the Trump administration still insists on the maximum sanctions regime. Um, many in Korea argue that um, South Korea's NGOs, South Korea should be more proactive right, 
in, in, in maybe returning to the level of uh, uh, what do you say, the humanitarian assistance to North Korea before those uh, like eight years before those uh, uh, the, the Im Young Bagan Park Geun administrations, the, the, uh, the neocon uh, right wing government. So the the important point of the, the importance of that is this. You know, many of those so called humanitarian aids, even from great American groups they do not necessarily reach to the most remote places in North Korea. So what South Korean NGOs, South Korean assistant military in the past have done was to really help those people who are in the remote areas outside right, Pyongyang. Uh, so, we, so those are the ones that they're hurting the most. So I think that at this point, we should really, uh, as you pointed out, you know, one of our the, um, groups in the RPS delegation, you know, people who have been to North Korea, you know, about the, you know, the sanctions regime affect the electricity, you know, these are modern medicine, you know, and so we all need electricity, right? But you cannot do, in, in North Korea is not under the heavily, you know, sanctions, they can't even operate very simple procedure, you know, the simple thing, penicillin, you know, clean water, you know, the American Friends Service pointed out report that, you know, I mean, people, you know, you can't even build a well to have a clean water because of all this, the, the sanctions, right? And, but one more thing I want to point out, though, is that when I visited those members of Congress, this, even Democratic, when it comes to humanitarian issues, they were actually, they were very, they did want it, they were surprised, some of them were shocked about uh, this still the sanctions affecting these you know women and children and they were and, and some of the members of congress they said you know they even never met any american who'd been to north korea so one of our doctors who have been going to North Korea, and then you're know, talking to this uh, you know aides to the um, uh, members of congress she was she was just blown away oh my she, and at the end of the evening she said i have never met who um, you know anybody who've been to north korea i mean and you claiming to be a <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to be too uh, negative, but the point well, being, and, and yeah, of course, we've never met anybody from North Korea itself. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so that's why this, you know, our this uh, uh, um, advocacy uh, work is very, very important. What I found was there's really, really, I would say it's even the ignorance, lack of knowledge among people, among the lawmakers, there's who are ma literally making writing laws about sanctions, right? And they, I mean, they they were so uninformed. Well, can you say something about this legislation that was introduced to say that uh, Donald Trump were, uh, couldn't remove US troops from from South Korea? Oh, that was so it, uh, you know, both um, the Donald Trump, you know, he didn't say that Donald Trump never said he will, he will, he will, let's say he will withdraw, I mean, I will withdraw the, all those US 32,000 American troops, but the mere mentioning about, you know, about uh, American troops really, I guess, scared, frightened a lot of lawmakers. So there's uh, now the bipartisan um, uh, movement going on both uh, House and Senate and preventing you know, Donald Trump from making any sort of uh, a withdrawal of American troops. So the idea being that American troops will there for eternity in, in, in South Korea. And uh, um, it's, 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 of course, at, at some point, uh, one thing that I want to point out, a lot of people say when it comes to history, they say, well, what if it's going to, it means that basically North Korea wants the, you know, the withdrawal of American troops right away. But that is actually false. You know, all three North Korean leaders, uh, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un, they all said that, and this is on the record, they said that, you know, American troops for some time, they, they can, even after the, uh, let's say, even unification, they, they have a role to play. You know, they did not, they demanded that immediate withdrawal of American troops. And one thing, another thing, for their rationale, is that as you, if you look at South Korea, what is it? It's surrounded by the superpowers, right? So what they thought, I mean, well, also there's Russia and China, you know. So North Korea leader's position is that U.S. American troops, it may be somewhat idealistic, but it still has a play balancing role, right? Vis-a-vis -vis those even the Russia and China. So they never said, you know, peace treaty means that we draw American troops right away. But American sort of propaganda system, even the lawmaker that I talked, they the first thing they mentioned was. History means the withdrawing of uh, you know American third to I mean no that is not true, and uh, so but having but Congress having you know the, this bipartisan uh, sort of a, a, a mandate, it is it is very disappointing and especially in this time when they could, what I was hoping was more the bipartisan let's say resolution 
that support the Singapore summit. Wouldn't that be so awesome? Right. But instead, just every step of the way, they're creating these roadblocks so that Trump cannot move. So the many in Korean analysts saying that the biggest obstacle right now, I'm even reading the, I read an interview done by former um, unification minister of South Korea. He said that the, He's, he said the biggest obstacle right now is American media, the neocon security analysts who are shaping this public, trying to shape the public opinion that this process is not going to work. Trump, it can be Trump, you can leave this process to Trump, etc. So I think they really, really wanted to, they really want the American people to, you know, have a, you know, real uh, story about the process and how Koreans are supporting this process, you yeah. Well, thank you so much for updating us and for uh, ending us on that note to say that the biggest obstacle to the peace process are people in this country who don't want to see it happen either because they are part of the military industrial complex that benefits financially from conflict, or they might be from within the Democratic Party itself that want to see this process fail uh, to use it against Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. and uh, so I think our job as peace activists, as people who want to support the uh, people on both sides of the Korean Peninsula, is to be uh, educating our own media, our uh, communities, and to be putting pressure on our elected officials mm -hmm. that we want this peace process to move forward, uh, that this is a positive thing, and ourselves to be very skeptical of things that we read in the media especially when they uh, quote anonymous sources to say how North Korea is violating an agreement that hasn't even been signed. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for enlightening us. I think it will be great to get your list uh, of the US concessions versus those given by North Korea for people to understand that the North Koreans have actually uh, moved forward quite a lot in this process. And what we have to do is to push our own government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Simon. Bye. -bye,